We are here with Jared. What exactly is your title? Um, shoot, I know my title is um, kind of director of operations, but general manager, I guess would be a more uh, suitable title. It just kind of depends on the day. I run the retail day to day. And then I also do the single barrel program. I'm on the tasting board. Um, and I do a little bit of an ambassador work for him. So it just kind of depends on the week. So it's kind of hard to kind of pigeonhole where I'm at. But um, right. as you, when you're on the tour, you kind of you hop in wherever is needed. So sometimes I'm a, I'm a worker. Sometimes I'm a, a distiller. Sometimes I'm a, a bartender. Sometimes <laughs> it kind of just depends on the day. So before we get into the distillery specifically and the products you guys release, let's talk about your yeah. background. So when we did the tour a few weeks back, it was really clear that you knew your stuff on just sort of all sides, of the, which was cool because I feel like sometimes you get tours and it's just a tour guide yeah and you it's, get a the information. it's a good script but right it's a show um and you took it several steps past that which was, which that. was refreshing and it was educational yeah. and for part of i mean the big reason why we have this magazine and we have this uh podcast is to be able to educate people and introduce people to different industries right right and so you guys nailed the education side and then you have the history and the story behind it. Right. Um, but take us back to how you got into this, what your background is in the alcohol space. Yeah. Um, so I've been in the restaurant industry probably since I was 14. So my first job was a busser, uh, at a fine dining restaurant in Cincinnati. Uh, and my, my mother was a restaurant manager. My father was a, uh, restaurant supply salesperson. So I've been kind of dealt with that side of the industry my whole life. Uh, went to college at Xavier and then I uh, got my master's at EKU. Um, and it was in broadcasting. So nothing to do with the industry that I'm in now, which is kind of funny. And I think that's a very right. popular storyline is that you just because you got a degree in something doesn't mean that's what you're, it's going to be your life. Uh, and so while trying to make ends meet, I, uh, you know, I would bartend and work at wine uh, wine shops on the weekend and kind of got into wine before I really got into whiskey. Um, got my level one, level two sommelier uh, at the master court of sommeliers. And then I just recently got my level three. Um, but while doing my level three, I, you know, I got to meet Amir Pei, who's our owner here. And he uh, he knew my palate and he's met me a couple of times when me and him have seen wine and whiskey pairings. And uh one thing led to another and it was a perfect opportunity to kind of, you know, go all, all in on the whiskey industry, which with being in Lexington, you kind of have to went in Rome. And, uh, I started kind of curating my knowledge on whiskey and the history behind it, except, especially in the city. And, uh, I kind of stumbled upon this job with the mirror and I'm loving every minute of it now. So I've kind of taken my background in wine and kind of married it to the whiskey industry that I'm, I live in today. And, it's kind of where I'm at now. So very cool. Very cool. So your, your role at the distillery, especially with your background is kind of perfect because you're able to understand the distilling process, understand tasting, understand right. customer experience from the restaurant industry you were in. Like you've got, you've got all of them, which works really well. And so yeah, you mentioned Amir. Amir is the owner of the distillery. Correct. That is a super cool story about how he acquired yeah. it. So, so walk us through that. Yeah, so Amir, um, Amir was based in New York, and he was a sports writer and enthusiast, but also just a historian and entrepreneur. And uh, he stumbled upon the picture of the fight of the century, which is a 1914 uh, boxing match between Jim Jeffries and Jack Johnson. Um, and there's a beautiful silhouette photo of those two fighting in Reno, which they had to fight in Reno because it was racially charged fight between the historic white boxer and the up and coming black boxer, Jack Johnson. Uh, and Jack Johnson was sponsored uh, by James Pepper Distillery, which is a kind of a cool little fact. Mm -hmm. um, and so they couldn't do the fight east of the Mississippi due to the race situation. So they actually had to fight in Reno. Um, and he stumbled upon that photo and saw the, the banner in the background and, you know, the curiosity kind of itched and he kind of researched and saw that the, the distillery has been dormant for over 50 years. And, you know, as an entrepreneur and businessman, he realized that it was an opportunity that you couldn't pass up. And, you know, he got the rights to that DSP number, which is DSP five, which 
if you ever come to our distillery, it's all over the place and as well mm-hmm. as should be. Um, because I think DSP one is heaven Hill. So the fact that DSP five was able to be purchased and kind of resurrected from the dead, um, for those if who something don't know the DSP number is, what does that signify? And uh, it's distilled spirits plant, and we're number five. So every time you open a distillery, like if me and yourself were to open one today, it'd be in the twenty thousands, uh, which is oh, wow. pretty insane to even think about. Now, when you say twenty thousands as well, like there there isn't twenty thousand active distilleries. Obviously, there's some dormant ones or ones that have just unfortunately been out of business. Um, but being the fifth one in the state is quite astonishing. And that's where the history kind of comes in and really is the backbone of our, our distillery. Very cool. So yeah. back to back to the history. Yes. I, I derailed that. <laughs> no, you're good. Uh, so, so, so basically he, he came upon that, that, that fight. And, uh, and so he, Bought the code in 2008, where the distillery was. This area at one point was just destroyed. So in 2008, two landowners rebuilt the whole area up back to what it looks like today, and then started asking for different vendors to kind of take control of each building. So uh, obviously, Amir reached out quite fast and said, "Hey, I really want to resurrect this whiskey business, uh, the history of James E. Pepper, and things like that." Um, and so in 2000, 2017, our first barrel rolled across. Uh, and actually, um, we just released our first distillate coming from DSP five, uh, this year. So very exciting. Yeah. So you guys, uh, this, this, the distillery, even before you, you guys owned it goes back to what year? Shoot. Uh, so technically, uh, 1776, which is our namesake when it comes to our flagships. That's when we broke ground in Virginia. Um, uh, you know, 1792 is when Kentucky became a state. So we, we weren't there yet. Um, but then when uh, Elijah moved the uh, company to Versailles uh, to where Woodford Reserve is actually located now. And then when Elijah unfortunately passed away, which is James Pepper's grandfather, uh, Oscar Pepper took over uh, and then expanded it in Versailles to a lot of the buildings that are still there today. So when you go on that Woodford tour, they kind of mention uh, Oscar and James quite a bit. Uh, before, unfortunately, financial ruin happened when he was 15. Uh, because when his father passed away, when James was 15, E.H. Taylor kind of bought him out because that was his godfather. And so when E.H. Taylor bought him out, kind of helped out for the business for a little bit. And so they ended up selling it to what it is today's Woodford Reserve. So really cool history. And then James Pepper, when he finally took over, uh, moved it to Lexington, Kentucky and to the location that we're at today. So uh, 1910s when that date kind of happened and I mean history set from there so we're in the building from the original building from what was rebuilt in 1934 that's crazy and the, the what's cool is like on the tour and then photos you guys have yeah. uh, on the tour all over the building of the original build right it, right in the original in the original, in the original blueprint were found when they rebought the facility. There was a safe that was in the old ice, which is where it's an ice cream shop now, but there was a safe on the second floor. They broke into the safe and had all the original blueprints, all the original mash builds from 1934. And we're actually working on the 1942 classic bourbon that's on our still actually yesterday. Uh, we're working on that exact mash build from what we found in that, that safe. It's really exciting. That's crazy. Did they make bourbon that differently back then where it would be more of a unique mash bill or, or what? I wouldn't say unique mash bill. bill. It's a, it's a very, very high rye. So it's a 51% corn, 49% rye, no malted barley at all. So it's a little bit more simple. Um, and then has a little bit more of a balanced mass or um, palate on it. So it kind of has sweet and spicy all together. Uh, it's good. At least the high wine is. Obviously, we haven't tasted the uh, finished product. We have a we have a couple of years to wait on that. Um, right. But the the high wine is tasting fantastic on it right now. Yeah. So that that's an interesting point. When we did the tour, you took us over to the still, and then yeah. filled up cups straight from the still. That seems to be a lot of distilleries' party trick. Like you try yeah. the real thing, you try the finished product, but they're like everybody, you got to compare it to what this started as. Right. Your, whatever you guys are doing, uh, one of the guys that was with us bought a bottle of it 
Well, I think they both yeah. did. And they were saying that was one of their favorite products they tried on the entire trip. And it's unaged straight from the still. What is it? 130 yeah. proof? You're looking around 134 to 136, depending on the mash build. But the fact that it's that high proof and yet that clean is uh, right. hard to find. And nothing against anyone else's product because I've tasted a lot of high wines that are really good. I've yet to find one that's that delicious and grain forward and it re- complex at the same time. And it just like, it kind of sets you up for success. And I'm really, really excited for the stuff that we're going to be coming up in the next four to five years. Yeah. I probably wouldn't advise someone to just drink straight high wine or no. white dog or whatever you call it. But if they were, what you guys are making is drinkable. It's super yeah, hot, super drinkable. You know, what's really cool is that people can purchase that in the, in the, in the, in the like, like yourself, like purchase that high wine. So you can almost give a personal tour to someone that maybe couldn't make the trip or just mm-hmm. wanted to taste our product. It's really cool to be able to set somebody up at your home to be like, all right, this is coming right off the still. And this is a great transition to maybe one of our single barrels. And then from one of our single barrels, to possibly one of our blends. And it's just, it's, a, it's almost like you can give the tour at home. And I think that's what we're trying to project because obviously not everyone can make a trip out here. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's really, really nice to kind of bring that experience back home. So, and like I said, we don't do much marketing and we don't do much ambassador work. So uh, our customers are kind of our, our, our marketing people. So, you know, it's kind of nice to have that, that beginning to end process being able to be purchased in our retail shop. I'm finding that to be the case in, all three of these industries where you have the brands that are huge, they have PR agencies, they have marketing agencies. And it's almost like the more people you involve in your marketing, the less personal right. it becomes. Yeah. Uh, and so I like the organic approach that you guys are doing. Well, I mean, or I mean, if you just walk in here, right? I mean, you know, we're not really hiding any punches. We, we tell you our mash builds, we tell you if we're sourcing it or we're contract sourcing it. Um, you know, we don't have people wearing suits and ties in here. You know, I'm, I'm literally wearing my work outfit right now, which is a flannel and jean. You know, it's kind of a blue collar mentality with a high end, uh, you know, product, if that even makes sense. So, no, you um, got that. That's perfect. Yeah. And so you guys have, you started in 2017. You said that's when your first barrel. Yeah. Old. You have how many out right now? And then how uh, many are fully? So discovered? give or take, so give or take the week. Um, like right now we have seven SKUs, so different seven different bottles that are able to be purchased, uh, two flagships, three single barrels, uh, and then we have our two allocated items right now, which are our 1776 barrel strength, uh, which are still blended, still MGP, still three and a half year, but barrel proof, so no blending down, because usually the bourbon comes off the still at 110, uh, and the rye comes off the still at 120, so it takes a little bit of water to get it to 100 proof, which is our flagship. With our barrel strength, we just kind of go as is. So the bourbon comes off at 116, and that's what it's coming off out of the barrel. And then the uh, uh, rye is coming off at 15.8. So okay. a little stronger, but it's uh, complex. And we make sure we hand dip it to make it look a little bit more special and a little bit rare. Um, but we actually just sold out in the in the retail. We sold out on Saturday of all the bourbon. So if it's allocated and it's in your state, I hope you can get it. Um, once it's gone, it's gone. So is that so? So you're saying it's gone. Once it's gone, it's gone. Does that really mean you're good. not more? Not until next year. Okay. Very cool. Yeah, we, so we release the, those two items once a year, um, and I know in the future we're probably going to be releasing a lot more bourbon and stuff that's coming from DSP five and not MGP. Um, but we have a great relationship with MGP, and anyone that says that they don't. Uh, like their flavors just you obviously don't know a lot of the distilleries that actually use MGP's products right. um, we have a great relationship we're going to continue that relationship with them just because our flagships are so successful and it's really kind of the the entryway into what we can really do yeah I don't know why some distilleries hide hide MGP behind their label they should be proud of it they should be they should be yelling that yes, we have a great relationship. We're using quality, quality, quality juice. Um, is it, same thing with the mash build. We, do, we, we don't hide our mash build because, you know, the internet, the way it is now, either listening to a podcast like this or just going to a blog site. I mean, you're going to be able to find mash builds on almost every product out there. So, you know, we tell you right away, and especially on our old pepper lines, that seal that's known at E.H. Taylor and James Pepper did with the bottled and bond, 
we'll tell you exactly where it's coming from and what the mash build is on the back. So, yeah, it's always strange when I find it in the cigar industry too, not as much, but when people are trying to be secretive about one thing is like the specific breakdown or mash bill or right, ingredient right. Problem. But the other one is like, why wouldn't you want to brag about the partners you're working with? Yeah. Uh, well, because we're also using them, we're using them as marketing as well. So, you know, MGP is very prideful of using our product. When we sourced Farstown Bourbon Company and uh, Castle and Key is our, our, our Rick houses before we had our own, we were super prideful about it and we thanked them and we said, please send people our way and vice versa. We're sending people your way. You know, the good thing about this industry, at least I hope everyone thinks this is that we want to ping pong people to other locations because I, I call it snowflake industry where, you know, not two places are exactly the same. So why, mm-hmm. why wouldn't you want to, you know, try a different cigar than what you got in, you know, in Cuba. I'd rather have to try something from Italy or try something from the Amer- from Maryland. So it's like one of the things where I feel the same way about the whiskey industry. It's like, you know, tell people that you use Castle and Keys Rick House. You know, why right. did you use it? Why did you make that relationship with them? Um, why? Because our single barrel program right now, we're sourcing our barrels from Bardstown Bourbon Company. It's really good product. Like, we're very right. happy. We're waiting on our juice. Let's be honest. Like, it's, it's, it's a risk and reward. It's a gamble. Um, and we're prideful about it. I know Amir is too. I mean, we've, we've created these great relationships and we want to continue them, not break them off. So. so you guys have, I mean, it's a big building. It's a big operation. But when you walk through, which I'll have photos in the print issue. So we're going to be highlighting yeah. you guys in this next issue. Um, it's, it's small. Everything that you're working on is it's being worked on that day and then out the door the, the next you guys can't store barrels for no so so that, County, that, fork, think, that forklift was moving so it's kind of that like where's the egg so to speak we're like where, what stuff's coming in what stuff's coming out so like anything any barrel that's near our still right now is strictly for the barrel pick program so anytime that anyone wants to do a single barrel pick program that's where it's located and we usually pull three right. per pick and so right now those are all coming from bars on bourbon company uh but, you know, when it comes to next to the still about getting it out, Fayette County licensing is that we have to have it out due to fire code regulation because the city almost burned down in the 1930s, um, which we don't know who was the culprit of that. It could have been us. I don't I couldn't find that. I know our distillery burned down in 1933, so it, it totally could have been us. Um, right. But basically, our Rick House has to be outside the city limits, which is that's probably why there's not many Lexington distilleries. I think there's five or six. Um you know, there's much more when it comes to Louisville, Northern Kentucky, things like that. Um, so our Rick House is in Midway, which 15 minutes away, nothing crazy. You know, but before that, we had to go to Bardstown or we had to go to Fer- Versailles or Versailles if you're not from Kentucky. Um, but it's one of those things where it's, it, it's super inconvenient, to be totally honest. But you roll with the punches and you kind of deal with it. Uh, but yeah, that forklift is moving constantly. It's probably our most used uh, piece of machinery besides their still. Um, so like I said, and everyone has to be a fork or a CDL forklift driver here. You know, everyone has to pitch in at some point. If someone goes down, someone has to step in because we don't have time to wait on product. We have to right. legally get it out of here. So it's kind of a, it's a risk reward, but you know, at the same time, it's really nice if someone's on vacation or if someone's sick or gets injured, uh, someone can fill in right away, which is great. Very cool. So let me grab yeah. let me grab these two bottles. These are the two yeah. that I bought when I was there. One of them is just your straight rye. Oh, rye. Yeah. This is one that is an MGP product. Correct. Three um, and a half years. Uh, which is phenomenal. Yeah. That's it's this almost, is one it's almost and the it's price almost sold and. I, I keep interrupting you. I apologize. No, you're good. You're good. Uh, it's our most sold and most uh, awarded product that we have in here. And we make our, our old fashioned, which came from the Pendennis house. We use that rye because it's the original recipe in Mashfield from that first old pepper whiskey that was used in the old fashioned. So um, really cool product. 59% corn, uh, 36% rye, and 5% malted barley. So very interesting mash build on it, but it actually kind of mm-hmm. tends to be a very approachable rye and not something that's just going to burn you up as soon as you drink it. Um, and with it being a hundred proof, the proof's there, but not overpowering. So uh, we're super prideful about that product. And then this bottle, this was oh, the yeah. one that I found to be the most interesting. 
Yeah, um, so that's our that's our distillate that's coming from DSP five, which should be on that label that wrap on the top. Uh, oh yeah, on the very top yep. of it. So that that wrap, which is an homage to E. H. Taylor. So we do these little slight homages, or kind of tilt to the cap to our history. And so with E. H. Taylor being one of our forefathers, uh, we really wanted to make sure we honored him. So with all our single barrels, that's why we have that wrap. Uh, but yeah, that's a heritage line. So that's a hundred percent heritage rye which basically means that that grain's coming from the state of Kentucky and not from Germany or Canada or Maryland. Um, so we wanted to make sure we give it an homage to all the farmers that have been our backbone of our industry. So we source that rye grain from the same place we source our corn, which is Gilkinson Farm. Uh, okay. So the, they probably shares a very similar terroir. So I think that actually dictates the flavor of it. And if you were blind in it, I, I, I don't think the common man or woman would... Uh, automatically go to rye and so i think it's a very approachable very fruit forward very honeysuckle notes um it's just an incredible product we're very excited that's our first distillate that's coming from our distillery and we couldn't pick a better batch than what we ended up picking and so what do you guys have next what do you have on the still drink? is there anything uh, releasing soon that you're allowed to talk about i i wouldn't say there's a, a timetable but i will let you know that we do have a uh, our single, our single malt coming out, our two-year single malt, which is very highly sought after. We have a very big Irish population here in Lexington. So our single malt whiskeys are very popular. So I know that's coming out in the near future. And then our FKO bourbon is going to be getting released really soon. And our FKO line stands for Finest Kentucky Oak, where we hand-select the barrels. Um, and then we transfer it into a second barrel. So it's pretty much a double barrel or, mm-hmm. a, or, or, or a double oak. And so we age it for four years, and then we transfer it into a second barrel for six months. And then we char it at a different level than the original barrel. So we'll probably go from a, a char level three on the first barrel to either a toasted or a level four, depending on what we really think it needs. So between myself, uh, Amir, and the master distiller, Cody Giles, we kind of just really dictate what that flavor really needs to become. And so we're releasing our first, because we've had the FKO rye um, for about three years, and it's been very successful. It's our most highly allocated product. But the FKO bourbon should be beginning release, if not this year for the holidays, uh, early, early 2023. Very cool. Which, I'm excited to, I'm excited yeah, to try that. Yeah, that, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. The branding is interesting because when I, when I told people I was going down to your distillery, yeah, and then they're like, what do they make? I don't know. Old Pepper. And then you said 1776, and they're like, oh. Same product. And, is, 70, is 1776 kind of what you guys are standing behind as your branding, or is that just the product? A little bit of both, and I, I hate to give like a complex answer. So the 1776 line is named because of the uh, – James used to call his grandfather's whiskey Old 76. Okay. Uh, due to the fact that's when they broke ground in Virginia. Uh, so when I say like it's kind of our branding, it's just – that's our flagship, and we want to keep it as that. And so anytime that you see an old pepper line, that means it's usually going to be a single barrel or a double barrel, but it's always going to be barrel strength. So it's going to be one of those things where it, it's an, each one's an ode to the old pepper whiskey, which is or old pepper uh, distillery, which is our namesake. Mm-hmm. And then the other one is 1776 an ode to what James used to call his grandfather's whiskey, which is the old 1776. Very cool. Yeah. That stuff yeah. definitely sticks out on a shelf. Yeah. And, it, and it's one of those, and that's on purpose, obviously. But like, it, and the good thing about it is that the price point of being between, depending on the market, obviously. But you know, at the distillery itself, we charge thirty five dollars for it. And then, to me, that's a great price point where it's not bottom shelf and it's not high end where you don't feel like you can afford it. So it's right. kind of made for the blue collar drinker, but made for the high quality experience. So yeah, the law of diminishing returns is definitely present with yeah all of these industries, I think. Yep. Yeah. Um, so it's cool when you find something that's like you said, not super bottom shelf price, but then right. you can line it up in a tasting with real top shelf, high end stuff. It's right there. Yeah. 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 Um, there's so many, there's so many bourbons and, and rides that I've tried that I haven't been able to purchase, but find them at a bar, get a sample of them that maybe, MSRP is somewhat yeah. reasonable. And the second it jumps over to secondary, the prices just get ridiculous. Ridiculous, yeah. And that's and unfortunate because a lot of this stuff is dictated through availability of glass, availability of labels, availability of cork. 
Um, shipping in general has become a huge issue in our industry. Uh, and so I understand how sometimes prices will jump, but we've, we've done a pretty good job uh, with making sure our, our, our wholesalers are getting an affordable price that they can make sure that our prices are going to be in that level. Mm-hmm. Because I think it justifies the taste, palate, and everything else. I mean, we've done a lot of market. Ramirez done a great job with the market research and you know getting our product in the right spot in the shelves, right spot in these restaurants, like cocktail program things like that. So uh, it's a tough business, but you're right. Like it, it, the the secondary market sometimes justifies palate, which is unfortunate. Yeah, that's that's always interesting to watch. Especially, you have people that buy them with no intent in drinking them. At all. And it just becomes a game. It just becomes a commodity. It just. It's like trading I, cards. I get it. Right. But it's too good to just let it sit. You're not going to eat a trading yeah. card. Yeah. Our product, and I think we do, we, I think we aggressively price it for that reason, too. Uh, you know, we're not here for that secondary market. While our product can dictate that on certain one of our certain bottles of ours. We want people to be enjoying it. We want people opening it up and revisiting, just like our our tours. You know, our tour guides are so unique that we want you to come back on another tour because it's going to be different than the last tour you went on. You know, and I think that that goes through our whole company. We want you to keep reusing our product, keep coming back, because I think you're going to have a new experience each time. Very cool. Well, I won't take much of your time. Um, (laughs) No, I'm excited to get you guys highlighted in the next issue and spread the word. We appreciate it. Um, we appreciate it. You got to come back down for some of our bourbons that we're releasing in the next. Oh, we'll, be back, we'll be back yeah. down. I'm planning awesome. a trip down to um, Indiana and then Kentucky again sometime. In the oh, that'd be great. Month Just let so. me know. Let, let me know. know. But all right. Well, enjoy your day. Thank you for coming on the podcast and we'll talk soon. Of course. All right, buddy. All right. Bye.